You're listening to Living Full Out with Nancy Soleri. As a successful motivational speaker and trusted life coach, Nancy knows how you can live the life you want regardless of the challenges you face. Although she's legally blind, Nancy's mission is to inspire others to overcome obstacles and live life full out. Call in at 800 3001 to ask Nancy for advice on topics such as relationships, finances, business, health, and more. Just call 800 333 0001. Once again, that's 800 333 0001. And now, here's Nancy. Welcome to the Living Full Out Show. I hope everyone's having a great Saturday. So, today we're going to be talking about obstacles. Who doesn't have them, right? I mean, obstacles are one of those things that just come up in life. And I feel like every show, whether we talk about personal development or, you know, tapping into our highest potential, we always will have those obstacles that we have to get over. But today is about you. It's about assessing in your life which obstacles are holding you back. So if I think about my life, you know, one of the things that I've had to get over is my inability to see things, being that I'm legally blind. So I've had to find creative ways to uh, ask for assistance or creatively use low vision aids so that I can hear things that I can't see. So think about in your life, how can you get creative to get around over under those obstacles. We are going to be taking your calls. The number again is 800-333-0001. Again, 800-333-0001. And later on here in the show, we will have a very special inspirational guest. And he'll be sharing with us about how he's overcome the, the traumas in his life and how today he's still dealing with those obstacles, yet each and every day thriving in a positive way. And what, what, what we kind of think about where we are in the time of the year as we prepare for a new year, closing out this year, you know, one of the things I want you to think about is reflection, not just concentrating on what hasn't gone right this year, but what has gone right. I think a lot of times we're so hard on ourselves. We pick at ourselves. We're sometimes our worst critic. And mindset is critical in driving you to where you want to go in achieving your goals and dreams. The self-talk, the way that you talk to yourself is also very important. Think about taking out words like don't, shouldn't, couldn't, or even negative words like try, I hope, You know, you want to set yourself up to be successful. You want to not allow those obstacles in your life to control you, to have power. I know when I think about moving into next year and the various challenges I've had this year, I've learned a lot. And one of the things that I've learned the most is that we hear it so often times, oh, I want to win the lottery or... You know, I, if something were to fall in our lap, it would change our lives. But what I've realized is that that isn't always the case. If I were to win the lottery tomorrow, it wouldn't change every obstacle in my daily path. It wouldn't take away every challenge. If you were to get that great job that you're striving for, it won't eliminate every challenge in your daily life. But again, that's where... When you don't allow the ops to have that power, when you take that power back, when you do self-care, when you are positive in your thinking, when you put together a plan of action that every day allows you to make a little bit of an impact towards your goals and dreams, now you're living on purpose. And that's a lot of how you get past those obstacles in your life. An obstacle, a challenge, whatever we want to call them, if, if they come up, you want to look at it, kind of look at it right in the face and go, you know what, I'm not going to allow you to throw me off my path. Trust me, I have a lot of those conversations with myself. And it's so important that you have that ability to not allow to dictate your ability to move forward. It's really important, too, that as we consider 
things that have occurred in our life. Sometimes they're mistakes that we've made, bad decisions, um, our ability to be not make a decision, indecision, a lot of times they can influence our ability to move forward in life. But I want you to t- think, think about taking responsibility for that decision. I think a lot of times we feel bad, you know, if we make a bad decision or we think, could I have done something differently, that paralyzes us from being able to move forward. And the thing is, if, if you can allow yourself to not be so hard on yourself, then you won't have that need to, to feel bad about yourself, to put yourself down, and you won't have those burdens on your shoulder. You know, there's been a couple different times in my life where I've put myself out there, I've overextended myself, and I got a swift kick in the booty, if you know what I mean. And that's okay, because with those lessons, I grew stronger. And I know that for each of you listening today, you've had those similar experiences. So it's not allowing those experiences to dictate our ability to move forward, but rather to compartmentalize them, put them in a place of the past, and move forward. Now we're going to go to the phone lines. Welcome to the Living Full Out Show. Hi, welcome to the show. Hi, Nancy. Hi. Hi. So what's going on today? I have a longtime friend who I feel isn't being supportive of me and my decisions about my future. We've been friends for a really long time, but I want to know when when do you think it's a time to let go of the friendship when you feel you aren't being supported? Mm, That's a great question. And in fact, I'm dealing with that right now myself. (laughs) Here's the thing. Friendships, like a lot of relationships, if, if you really love that person, love is unconditional, right? But at the right. same time, there are friends and family that might come in and out of our lives in different chapters in our lives. So this friend, I imagine, did you grow up together, whether it be in high school or college, or were you coworkers? No, actually, we met through our children. Oh, Okay. So the connection that you had when your friendship was the strongest is, is what brought you together still an, an environment that you share today? Um, no. Okay. Our, so it's different. They're different. So when you think about your friendship today, do you have a lot in common? Um. Probably is not probably not as much as we used to have in common. Okay, and so where I'm going with this whole thing is, if you ever have a friend that's not supportive of where you are today, part of life is that we evolve and we grow, and and true friends will always cheer you on. They may give you their two cents of advice, but they'll still support you in your path. If you find that somebody is being hard on you or or not there for you, it might just be that they're a friend from your past, but it doesn't mean that that same friendship is going to be in the future or the present. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. And I believe that it's great to love the friendship. So if you can bring a friendship into today and you can carry a friendship over the span of your whole life, you know, we each have one or two of those people that we've been friends with forever, right? But then there are going to be those people that are just friends who came into our life during certain chapters, and it might not serve our growth for them to continue to be close friends. Like It's kind of like it's kind of like forcing it. Does that make sense? No, I totally understand this. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And lastly, I'll say, just make sure to always keep your head up high, meaning that if you've reached out to that friend and you are a good friend and you've tried to be supportive, maybe you've even asked them to be more supportive, if it's just not giving you what you need, it just may be time to wish that friend well, not cut it off, not make it a big drama of a goodbye, but just let it kind of fizzle. 
All right. right. So thank you for calling in. You're welcome. All right. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So she brings up a great question, right? Changing friendships, the way that we might evolve one friend or family member might evolve faster or slower than another, that can be an obstacle in a relationship. So that was a great question. We're going to go back to the phone lines. Welcome to the Living Full Out Show. Hi, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm good. So share with us, uh, what's going on in your life? I live a pretty, you know, stressful, hectic life, you know, with pretty much the basic school and work and family. So my question would be, how can I live a more stress-free life? You know, how to manage everything. Mm. We all want that. (laughs) You know, here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's really important to remember what brings you joy. So what is something yeah. that does bring you joy, that makes you happy? To be honest, just being with friends or just actually sitting on the couch and watching TV trying to relax. Those there are you go. The ones. Yeah. Sometimes in life we overcomplicate things, we overthink things. Life is always going to be stressful, but the main thing is is that those habits, those good habits, or those pleasures in your life, hold them near and dear to your heart. So relax this weekend, take time for yourself, call a friend, and then you will naturally de-stress. And just remember, turn to those good habits whenever you need them. Yes, you're totally right. (laughs) Well, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you for calling in and uh, have a wonderful helping. day. You too. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. So, we'll be coming right back with our inspirational guests after these messages. Dinner party wonderful? Jeanette and Bill did so much planning, and the house looks great. Well, you know, it was almost canceled. Did you hear that Bill was really sick with the flu two weeks ago? No, I had no idea. I've been so busy at work. But my coworker's toddler was in the hospital with flu, too. Is Bill okay? It was pretty serious and aggravated his asthma. Bill got sick quickly with a high fever. Fortunately, Jeanette got him to the doctor right away. The doctor said it was flu and prescribed a medication that helped him get back on his feet. I didn't know flu was so serious until I heard Bill say he felt like he'd been hit by a truck. He missed a big meeting at work. Well, thank goodness Jeanette had gotten her flu shot. Because, you know, she's expecting... (gasps) What? (laughs) Oh, man. I guess that was another thing you guys didn't know either. A message from the Department of Health and Human Services. Hi. I can't come to the phone right now because I'm abusing my children. Not just verbally, but physically. I'll get back to you. If only child abuse was this easy to recognize. If you even suspect abuse, call Child Help at 1-800-4-A-CHILD or visit childhelp.org. We've helped millions of people help millions of children. All calls are anonymous and confidential. So call 1-800-4-A-CHILD or visit childhelp.org. Child Help. Trust your instincts. Brought to you by Child Help and the Ad Council. Driving has a rhythm all its own. Don't wreck it with a text. Before you get behind the wheel, silence your phone. Or better yet, designate a texter. For more text-free driving tips, visit StopTextStopRex.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Today, you hit the snooze bar. You checked your email. You checked your fantasy football team. You rejected an insulting trade offer. You ate your lunch. You did all the things that one normally does the day before a 175-mile-per-hour hurricane blows through your city, leaving it in a state of ruin. You never know when the day before is the day before. Prepare for tomorrow at ready.gov slash today. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council.
You're listening to Living Full Out with Nancy Soleri. A professional motivational speaker, Nancy can help you overcome obstacles and start living full out. Call in with questions live at 800-333-0001. Once again, that's 800-333-0001. And now, here's Nancy. Welcome back to the Living Full Out Show. I'm Nancy Soleri, and today we are talking about how to get over around those obstacles in our life. I mean, sometimes obstacles are somewhat lighthearted, still disturbing if it's a pop tire in your car or something like that. And other times it might be losing a job or financial stress, anything that prevents us from moving forward towards our goals and dreams and thriving in life. Now, I want to welcome Arvilla Thomas, because sometimes obstacles can be habits that we create in our lives, or in some cases, things that we may be, um, that we may do um, that take our path, take our life path in a different direction. So I don't want to give it all away until Noah comes on and tells his story. But truly, from age 13 up until today, where he's 28, he's been on a life journey where he's had a lot of pressures, um, a lot of decisions that he's had to make in his effort to get back to feeling healthy. I'd like to welcome Noah Thomas. Hey, thank you for having me. Hi, Noah. I didn't want to give your story away because truly you tell it best. You lived it and you're still living it today. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But if you could share with our community, let's go back to when you were 13 because that's really when it all began. Can you share with us about your lifestyle at that point? Absolutely. Uh, First, I do want to say thank you for for having me on here. Any chance that telling my story may benefit another person absolutely brings me some peace of mind. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And, yeah, referring to your question, of course, uh, 13 is when I found alcohol for the first time in my life. And uh, it was definitely a a moment that, that changed my life forever. And, of course, as you know, but not not for the better. Yeah. Now, you know, how did you get alcohol at 13? I mean, I know as a parent, you know, they always wonder how do our kids get this alcohol? And of course, (laughs) you know, as kids, we're very resourceful with fake IDs and older friends. How did you get the alcohol? Well, I was at a friend's house. Uh, He lived in Scappoose, Oregon, and we were upstairs being innocent kids. I was a summer of seventh grade year, and his older brother was having a party downstairs. I was never, neither of us were ever invited to go down there in the past, but for whatever reason, his 17-year-old brother let us come down, and um, and he put a beer in my hand. And not only did he put a beer in my hand, but he, he poured three beers into a big gold cup from 7-Eleven, and he told me that the only way I was able to participate and hang out was to uh, drink it as fast as I could. And so that was literally my very first experience drinking was to drink for the effect and to drink as hard as I could. And um, and what ended up happening was nothing short of, like, the greatest moment of my life or so I thought at that moment. And um, and I felt a sense of relief and courage and, and power and enthusiasm that I'd never felt prior. And it was one of those feelings that I would go on to chase basically every waking moment uh, from that moment on. Wow. And you, you dealt with this alcoholism throughout your really all your teens and most of your 20s, when, when you find alcohol, do you feel guilty that you're drinking it? Is it? What are the emotions that you were going through, let's say, through your teenage years? Well, through my teenage years, I didn't feel a sense of guilt because I didn't realize that I was experiencing alcohol in any way that wasn't completely normal. I truly thought I was just like everyone else. And, and of course, it, you know, with drinking at the time, at least in my perception, being so fun and so consequence-free other than uh, being sick the next day, which is something I started to experience immediately in the form of a hangover, of course. But I, I didn't sense any guilt because I just thought it was normal. Uh, and so mm-hmm. even when I would get in trouble, I just thought that's what happens. You know, you drink, you, you have all that courage and all that excitement, and, you know, you do silly things. And I just, I don't know if it was media. I don't know if it was having people that didn't really know how to handle the way I responded to alcohol uh, maybe reinforcing me in the wrong ways. I just I thought it was basically all good until it started to become obvious that it wasn't. But that was a slow process. Um, you know, I, I spent the beginning years of my drinking just thinking it was normal to, well, to drink the you, way I drank. 
you did kind of get caught in your in in really a situation that you put yourself in but had lots of consequences and that was at 14 correct that was at 14 at 14 i uh i decided to sneak a bunch of um hard alcohol from a friend's parents liquor cabinet and what ended up happening after that was i um i decided to break into a local school that was near my house and i vandalized and uh and i stole and I paraded myself around, and I got caught, um, you know. But I, I just, I still remember that invincibility, that fearlessness. And even at the time, I think some weird part of me thought it was still maybe cool that I did that. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't have a very strong moral compass when drinking was involved. So Now, the, because you were rather popular, even the kids at school kind of cheered you on or praised you for that. Um, what were, where were your parents this whole time? My parents were, <laughs> they were uh, actively trying to, to get me help. I mean, I, I, was, um, I was expelled from my school when that happened. I was made to do community service the entire summer, and I was put on the tightest leash I'd ever been put on in my life. And prior to that, I felt like I'd done a pretty good job at being sneaky and being clever with uh, my drinking. Usually they didn't know what was going on because it happened when I visited friends' houses, or more specifically the friends in Scapoose. And so uh, I think it was their uh, being unaware that I had the access that I did. And I, I definitely don't think they realized that, that I was drinking the way I was drinking or that I was um, behaving the way I was behaving. So obviously getting arrested was a wake-up call, and, uh, and they put me on a tight leash, and that tight leash definitely led to uh, much less consumption, which led to me not getting in trouble for a while. So... But clearly, trouble found you once again. Um, oh, yeah. sh share with me, I'm just curious, in, in your teen years and in your early 20s, so many of us socially drink. And what are the signs that a friend should look for or a parent should look for? And what could someone have done to have helped you in those years? You know, that's, that's a, a loaded question. That's a really big question. I want to be clear in saying that I'm, I'm not a, uh, an addiction counselor or an addiction medicine person. Um, but through my experience and, and working with others and knowing what I know, hindsight being twenty twenty, I just think, um, man, that's a really good question. What to look for? I guess well, basically... Well, now, now, I ask you this question, Noah, because you shared with me something that I thought was very powerful. When you drove to the police station with like a six-pack of beer, hoping they would just give you a DUI, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so mean, we're, we're that, fast that was kind of a cry you know, for help. Oh, that, oh, a huge cry for help, a huge cry for help. And, and, and we're, we, we're fast-forwarding big time to go to that moment because, um, you know, it took a while to get to that sort of desperation because I, I didn't realize I wanted to stop where I needed to stop. Um, and I didn't realize I was having a response to drinking. You know, I'm looking back, though, and I think one thing I can say for sure is that when Someone who, who is an alcoholic finds alcohol. Inevitably, there, there is no telling what's going to happen after they take their first drink. And I think it's one of those things, as a parent, you can start to observe, um, you know, if you, if you notice that your child is suddenly struggling with school or, or suddenly struggling with uh, following rules or suddenly becoming disinterested in basic life activities. You know, a lot of us have escapism in us. We, we want to feel better. We want to fit in. We want to be social. I think that's the role alcohol played for me and for a lot of people. Um, you know, and so I think it's for an individual, especially when you're young, it's just, it's really hard at that age, but can you identify that, you know, you're drinking for what reasons are you trying to, to seek out alcohol? And I definitely knew that I was seeking it out because it made me feel better. Um, and when I didn't have it, I didn't feel as good. I always wanted to feel better. And to that effect, building into what you said, uh, it led me to my very first time wanting to get sober when I was 19 because eventually I wasn't doing well. You know, I got out of high school and I went to college, but I went there to party. I didn't go there to study. And suddenly my friends were going there to study, and I was the one who no longer cared about that. I was maintaining appearances. And so suddenly my self-esteem took a hit. Uh, my mood started to take a hit. I started to deal with anxiety. And it became a little less... Um, and a little more difficult to deny that, that I was drinking very alcoholically, and it made me very insecure. And so I did try to get sober, and I failed because I, I wasn't willing to uh, do anything other than just try to not drink, which if you struggle with alcohol or drugs, it's very hard to just take away 
someone's solution because that's what alcohol was for me. So I took away my solution. I didn't replace it with anything positive, anything that could drive my life anywhere with value. And eventually I relapsed and that became my story and things got worse. And so that led to driving to a police station after drinking 12 beers and and, uh, parking out front and trying to decide if I would start honking my horn or maybe drive into the side of the building or do something to get me arrested because deep down I was uh, pretty afraid of myself and afraid of the path I was taking. You know, and it's interesting because you clearly had loving parents. You were well admired in school, and obviously the taste of alcohol, you know, really resonated with you, made you feel invincible, made you feel good. And and sometimes people might wonder, you know, what was it, where was your source of pain at that time that made you need to feel that good? Does that make sense? Well, what was, inter- what was interesting is I had a very charmed childhood. Um, you know, there's the source of pain, it more sort of uh, the inception of that pain sort of came right after I started drinking. I don't think I didn't realize anything was quote-unquote not feeling right until I felt how right I, I did end up feeling drinking, you know, if that makes any sense. So yeah. I think it was more realizing that I felt so complete when drinking that I started to become aware that maybe I wasn't feeling entirely complete or full before drinking. And then when time goes by and you sort of start using that as a solution, um, it, it becomes even more amplified. And suddenly the gap between where you were before and after it, it's just a larger one. And the lines get blurred. And now I don't really have a great sense of identity without my drinking. Um, or I start living between drinks. And I don't think a lot of us uh, realize that that's happening to us when we're drinking. I think when you're young, a lot of us just think we're having fun. We're just having yeah. fun. And then we well, don't realize it, when the fun stops, you know? Right. Well, your story gets a bit more intense, which we'll save that for for our next break. So yeah. we're going to be coming right back with Noah Thomas. Thank you, Noah, for being so vulnerable with your story here. And uh, we'll, we'll be, be right back. Thank you. Hi, professional skateboarder Tony Hawk here with Bugs Money and Daffy Duck to remind you to get moving every day. Because when you get moving an hour a day, you'll have the energy to skate through anything. <laughs> nice play on white, Doc. That's how I roll, Bugs. So whether you like to work the half pipe, now that's catching air, kick the soccer ball around, or dance in your room, just move it your way for an hour a day. The way you like to move, as long as you're moving. Carve out some time every day and get active. Because it's time to do a 180 on what you think exercise is. Because it can be whatever you want it to be. So be a player. Be a player. Get up and play an hour a day, Doc. Check out how to be a player at letsmove.gov. Head online to get tips on great ways to get moving every day. At www.letsmove.gov. Let's hear that one more time, Doc. That's www.letsmove.gov. A message from the Ad Council and HHS. I want to change some things. I want the moms where I live to have childcare they can trust. I want to make sure my little brother and his friends have a safe place to play. I want to help more kids graduate from high school. Help more hardworking families learn how to budget and save. I want more of my neighbors to have access to health care. Want to make a difference? There are so many ways you can. Help create opportunities for everyone in your community. I want to change what I see around here. United Way is creating real, lasting change where you live by focusing on the building blocks of a better life. Education, income, and health. I mean, I just want to see more smiles on my sidewalks. Reach out a hand to one and influence the condition of all. Give, advocate, volunteer. Live United. For more, visit United Way at liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. You're listening to Living Full Out with Nancy Soleri. As a trusted life coach, Nancy will help you overcome setbacks and embrace all life has to offer. Call in with questions live at 800-333-0001. 
Once again, that's 800-333-0001. And now, here's Nancy. Thank you again for joining us. I'm Nancy Solari, and this is the Living Full Out Show. Uh, We're continuing our conversation with Noah Thomas. He's been sharing with us about, at 13, how he started drinking alcohol and how that developed into his love for it and and really how that impacted his life and and becoming an alcoholic. Um, Noah, I'd like to welcome you back to the show. Thank you. Hi. So thank you for sharing with us about your early years and and how all that's developed for you. But can you share with us about that epic night where really you were trying to get clean and and, and go through rehab, but really things took a turn for the worse? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you could recap my entire early 20s of, of me trying and failing to control my drinking which is very hard for an alcoholic to do is control drinking. And I think I always assumed that if I tried hard enough and I cared enough, which I thought I did, that I would be able to control it. But um, I started to have more anxiety. I started to feel more depressive feelings. I certainly didn't understand why that was because I thought I had so much to be grateful for. And uh, I started to run the risk of losing the few things I did have that mattered to me, like the relationship I was in to the woman who's now my wife, uh, the job that I was barely keeping. I'd already dropped out of college, but I had a few things that sort of glued together my identity. And I went to rehab, um, self-inflicted. I took myself there, and I got out, and I was ready to do it different, but um, but I still didn't see this to surrender to my, my drinking problem. And I relapsed. And so that final relapse at 25 uh, led me to this opportunity to take this medication that was supposed to help me with cravings. It's called Vivitrol, and it's a naltrexone injection, intramuscular. And what you do is you take this injection, and it puts a ceiling effect on your receptors in your brain so that you cannot uh, get drunk in my case. And so they thought that the doctor thought this could help you. It could take away cravings. Maybe this could be the change you needed. Um, But uh, unfortunately, I had a paradoxical reaction to this medication, a very rare 0.05% chance type of reaction, and it spiraled me into a very severe, very dangerous clinical depressive order, uh, disorder Excuse me, with uh, agitation, anxiety, and a little-known condition called depersonalization, which is this feeling like you're in a dreamlike state. Hmm. I mean, I can't even imagine. It's like tr- trading alcoholism for now depression. And, and how did you handle that time of your life? I mean... I, I truly, I truly barely handled it. Um, if that makes any sense, I, mm-hmm. I, I think more I connect with the idea of surviving it. Within 30 days uh, of taking that injection, I'd had more panic attacks than I'd ever experienced in my entire life, which was zero prior to that. I lost almost 30 pounds because I couldn't eat, um, and I became severely suicidal. And I'm someone who. Looking back, I was dealing with some mild to moderate depressive symptoms and anxiety, but I think I had shame about that because I thought I didn't deserve to feel down. I had such a blessed childhood, loving friends and family. What did I have to be depressed about? Well, now there was a legitimate, uh, a severe chemical imbalance going on in my brain, and I just survived, you know, and everyone had to learn on the fly. My fiancé, my my parents, my friends, it was basically how do we keep Noah alive, and it was a learning uh, process, and we didn't do it perfect. Um, but we pulled it off. You know, I had to move back in with my parents. I immediately got psychiatric help. Um, I ended up getting a form of shock therapy. But uh, after a few months into that, I was so suicidal and so uh, verbal and vocal about it, and, and I, I was so um, unsafe that I got put into a psych ward. And that was when I found a book written by a man named Douglas Block called When Going Through Hell, Don't Stop. And it was uh, one of the first times I had realized that maybe someone else on earth had possibly experienced this level of depression. Hmm. So that book, you read it, and what breakthrough did it give you? How, how did you change your mindset? All I knew after reading that book was that I wasn't the only one on earth who was experiencing panic attacks and severe depression and and suicidality. These thoughts of being suicidal and having suicidal tendencies is very unfamiliar. It's very unnatural. To anyone who's ever had them, you feel crazy for having them. And it can be extreme, Nancy. It can be really scary stuff. Like you can be walking and a car could be coming and you can feel like afraid that you might lunge in front of it because you don't know that you can handle the pain you're experiencing 
for even a moment longer. And so I thought that that made me crazy, and I just thought that my chances for ever not being crazy from that moment on were nil because I didn't know any better. So reading that book, I heard my story. I just I, I identified with another human being. Another depressive person was able to gain my confidence that someone else went through it and recovered from it. And so I just had just enough flicker of hope to at least press forward. No certainty that I would get better, but if someone else could, maybe I could as well. Yeah. And and I want to respect this period of time that you went through because I can hear in your voice that this is difficult for you to talk about even today. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's one of those things you never forget. Um, I try not to use it as a negative way. I try to process some of that anxiety that it gives me just thinking about it. You know, and I try to use it in a positive, you know, to continue to live my life the way that I have been living it, um, which is a healthy one now, and I'm mentally stable, but I don't take it for granted because uh, I'm not guaranteed to not go back there. So, When someone goes through, you know, truly the, the years that you've been dealing with alcoholism and then this time in your life when you were depressed and suicidal, did you ever have, or maybe you still have those questions today, I and mean, I know we all do, like we wasted time, like oh, I just oh, wasted so much time. How do you deal with that? I deal with that by not wasting any more time. You know, if if uh, if me now, present day, is of course future Noah to me when I was, let's say, 21, I, I'm a little disappointed, you know, I, I, but I did, I lived the life I was supposed to live. It led me to where I am today. But I say that to the effect that how I'm going to feel in a few years, God willing, one day at a time, it will matter. And what I do today can directly impact how I'm going to be doing later. And I think having lost some time in the depression, lost a lot of time in my life with the alcoholism, very uncomfortable years, it makes me value and appreciate every moment. I mean, I can, I can take action, big or small, every day that will matter. It will impact. And I think it's understanding that compounding effect now that gives me a, a better sense of completion as a person going forward. Because before, I thought I had time, and I thought I was invincible, and I didn't realize I could be vulnerable to such dark parts of this life. And I was, and I don't, um, I don't have that ignorance anymore. And so I, I paid for it the hard way, but I lived to tell the tale, and, and I've been able to make a difference in other people's lives. And it sort of seems worth it now, as, as hard as that is to admit. Yeah. Well, again, we appreciate you being so open and, and vulnerable. Uh, so many times in our life, we have triggers that were created way back when we were teenagers, 20s, and throughout our lives. Are there triggers today that you have to be aware of so you don't slip? Oh, of course. Yeah, are we referring are more to the, the mood problems or more the drinking? Both. Both. Um, yeah, there are triggers. You know, if I notice that I'm starting to uh, have more hopeless thoughts or feeling more apathetic, then maybe I need to up my self-care. Maybe I need to check in with the mental health provider a little bit more frequently. Maybe I need to be a little more mindful of my sleep, you know, if that's being disrupted, if I'm waking up throughout the night. Um, if I find myself uh, running a little slow with energy, you know, there are little cues that start to let you know that, hey, maybe you need to tidy up whatever you can, so to speak, although I do try to live very <laughs> uh, structured and organized a life as I can because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to be so respectful of the depression. And for the drinking, uh, you know, it was realizing that the way I was doing it before, it, it was never going to work. I, me running the show would never, ever work for my particular case. I, I just don't have what it takes on my own to be a successful sober person. And I admitted that. And it was this big freedom to finally realize that it's okay. You know, I don't have to be the one to sort this out. There's a 12-step program out there where millions of people have already gone through it and millions of people who are just as hopelessly alcoholic as me are, are sober and they're happy. And that's the important you know, thing to, to note is that they're thriving. They're not just not drinking. And that's why I always got confused. So a trigger for me is I can't be around people that are drinking. I just choose not to. It's not because I judge anyone who's not drinking. It's because I can't take that risk with myself. I have too much to lose and I've been through too much to take any chances. So that's something, no matter what, I'll never be around someone drinking. I will, uh, I'll walk out of any opportunity that may come my way if there's drinking involved, like no matter what. Yeah, that makes sense. What do you, what, what advice do you give someone who says, I'm just sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, I, I keep drinking. I know it's not good for me, but I like it. It makes me feel good. I'm tired of the hangovers, but here we go again, every day, every day, or maybe they've relapsed and they are feeling 
angry at themselves for doing so. What advice do you have for those listeners? Well, I would, I would tell those listeners that they're in good company, that every single person who is lucky enough, and I do think there's a little stroke of just being, like, almost like you can just be grateful that you ended up sober. For everyone who's ever put together any time of sobriety, um, if you were a true problem drinker, then, then you can absolutely be certain that they had never put together that time until they suddenly did. What I mean is most alcoholics had really hopeless backgrounds and depressives, and just because you are uh, not doing well now, it has no guarantee, it's no way of dictating that you won't do well in the future. So try not to believe the voice in your head that says you're destined to fail, that you're doomed to be uh, this miserable. You absolutely can surprise yourself. You just have to leave your heart open to doing something different. If you can at least get there and admit that you're willing to do anything different, you have the same chance that I have to, to have a life that I absolutely love. And I didn't think I even deserved it. And here it is in my lap. So. And through all this, what survival skill are you most proud of that you developed through all these years of, you know, torture and feeling depressed and regrets? But what positive survival skill did you develop? Survival skill, like a, like a daily activity or more just like an intuition? No, just like, just like a way of coping. A way of coping? I think I just, this whole thing taught me that we as people are resilient. We are resilient people. We can overcome things that maybe on paper you'd look at and you'd say, I could never do that. I couldn't handle that. But we're a lot stronger than, than what's between our ears. You know, we, we have hearts that, that keep beating anyway, and we have bodies that keep moving. And so um, there's something to be said about the, the human spirit to just survive. And sometimes that's what you have to do. And I've proven to myself that no matter how weak or lost I felt, that I'm a lot stronger than I ever thought. And that strength is only compounded and grown over over this experience. So and we're stronger than we think. Well, Noah, thank you for being a part of our show today. You are a perfect example of what it means to live full out. And we're very proud of your, your success in, in being sober today. And thank you again for being on our show. Thank you for having me. It means a lot. Thank you. So we'll be right back after these messages, taking your calls. Thank you again, Noah. Hey, Dad. Yeah. You remember that ball game we went to a couple years ago? Sure. And how you didn't have enough cash for two hot dogs, so you walked with me on your shoulders until we found an ATM? And then when we got back to our seats, we never saw the hot dog guy again. Well, I don't remember all that. Yeah, that was an awesome game. You never know which moments will be the ones they'll remember forever. So take time to be a dad today. Learn more at 1-877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Medical mistakes claim tens of thousands of lives every year. The healthcare community is working on it, but you can help. When you communicate with your doctor, when you ask more questions, you reduce your risk of suffering a medical mistake. Doctors can't answer if you don't ask. Help reduce your risk. Questions are the answer. Learn the 10 questions you must ask. Visit www.ahrq.gov. This message brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and the Ad Council. I'm getting a catcher's mitt. I'm getting ice skates. I'm getting a devastating flood. Adults are generous. We're even giving kids global warming. But we can still reduce greenhouse gas pollution. Go to fightglobalwarming.com. Brought to you by Environmental Defense, the Robertson Foundation, and the Ad Council. There are many sounds in your daily life. Ones that make you smile. (laughs) Ones that help you relax. And there are some sounds that can help save lives. Wireless emergency alerts. Now on many mobile devices, use a unique sound and vibration to bring you critical information about emergencies in your area. With updates from local sources you know and trust, you can be in the know wherever you are. Learn more at ready.gov slash alerts. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. This is President Barack Obama. In the story of America, the greatest chapters are moments of challenge. When we see people serving their country and one another. 
Volunteers who step forward into hospital corridors and church basements, along levees and fire lines. And the next chapter is yours to help write. Sign up to volunteer at usaservice.org. That's usaservice.org. Let's renew America together. A message from Renew America Together, brought to you by the Ad Council. Living Full Out is about being courageous in your life. When obstacles come in your path, it's about having a strong mindset to tell those obstacles that they do not control your ability to move forward. When you live full out in life, yes, you're going to make mistakes. Yes, there's going to be blocks in your path, but you will be stronger for the survival skills that you learn and gain. You will be courageous in going after your dreams in a big way. You're listening to Living Full Out with Nancy Soleri. As a certified life coach, Nancy can help you to overcome challenges and start living full out. Call in with questions live at 800-333-0001. Once again, that's 800-333-0001. And now, here's Nancy. Welcome back to the Living Full Out Show. I'm Nancy Soleri, and today we're talking about how to overcome the obstacles in our lives. Now, When I say obstacles, again, it might be an emotional challenge. You might be dealing with a friendship that you've lost touch with or has caused you stress in your life. One of our previous callers called in about that. It may be an obstacle is a habit that you've created for yourself, ones that have an addiction to it, such as Noah Thomas, our last guest, on his dealing with being an alcoholic and going through depression and suicide. The thing is, is obstacles come in different forms. And it's how we handle those moments in our life. They're going to come and they're going to be small. They're going to be large. They're going to be heavy. They're going to be light. And sometimes we can just handle them easily. And sometimes it's going to need the support of others in your life. It's going to need for you to get resourceful, for you to tap into those survival skills. Don't ever be ashamed when something occurs in your life to have to ask for help. I think that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned in my life is that if I need help seeing something because I'm legally blind or getting somewhere because I can't drive, I've learned to put feeling ashamed or feeling like I'm a burden aside so that I can get done what needs to get done in a day and not feel bad for it. Um, This is your time to call in. Again, the number is 800-333-0001. We're going to go to the phone lines. Welcome to the Living Full Out Show. Hi, welcome to the show. Hi. 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 Thank you for calling in. What's going on today? Well, I have a really good friend who has early onset fat dementia, and recently she has been on a new medication for her for her symptoms. And I can tell that she is starting to act delusional again. But when I confront her, she won't believe me. So what what should I do about that? Well, that is tough because. Obviously, with dementia, sometimes things may be out of her control. Um, Have you spoken to her doctors or nurses? Uh, No, I haven't had a chance to do that because of the HIPAA laws and things. I did not think that I could probably do that unless she would have me down as somebody that they could talk to about her medical condition. Well, the reason why I ask that question is, if there's a close family member that you can talk to or someone that's with her every day, when we're dealing with a relative or a friend who's going through any health challenge, it could be cancer, it could be leukemia, it could be dementia, to, to have a little bit more insight as to the feeling, I guess the reception you're getting from her, is that something she's doing with others as well? Do you know that? Yes. Yes, she is, because I have talked to her family members as well, and they, they are starting to pick up on it, too, and they agree with me. Mm-hmm. And, and that's great. So as a collective group, all in this agreement that this is now occurring, 
how do they handle it? Well, they are discussing it with her as well. And I think maybe they may be making a little headway with her because she does still have some reasoning ability, Mm -hmm. but she does not think it's the medication that's causing any of her problems. The medication that she's on is great. So, Well, and the reason why I go there is because, yeah, the reason I go there is because we have friends for all different reasons in our life. Take away the health challenge, just if we're everyday, healthy, happy people. You may have a friend that you turn to for career advice or technical advice. You may have a friend that's a good listener, the person who would be the most empathetic in your life, the person who gives good advice. And this friend, even though she's going through these, this health challenge, the early onset of dementia, you want to figure out what friend does she need you to be right now in her life? Okay. So, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. while everybody may be trying to get through to her, what would be really interesting is to figure out, since you're all having the same experience, if one or two people are starting to get through to her, they may be the voice of that particular message that she's hearing. And maybe everybody else needs to be a friend in a different way. Because if everybody's coming at her with the same message while they're trying to be loving and and, um, supportive to her, she just may need somebody to love her. Just make this process not seem so scary. You know, be that breath of fresh air because it is scary. Yes, it is. And and how are you friends? What does that friendship connection come from? Uh, we've been friends since we were children. So we've just, all these years, we've raised our children together, and we've been really good friends like sisters. Right. And that's a very special connection. Yes, so it is. If I had this precious time with my friend, I would... From time to time, bring it up if you feel like the others are not getting through. But because your friendship goes so far back and you've really grown up together and you're really hoping to have more time together in the future, I would just be that breath of fresh air. I would be that person that reminds her to keep, keep fighting, to keep remembering, to, to just talk about everything. Help her with um, keeping her mind sharp. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Mm-hmm. Is that something that you think you can do, or do you feel like when you see her, you're more compelled to, you know, want to help her with the moment? Um, yeah, I think that's. I think it's definitely something I can do is just be there for her and be a friend and let her family try to take care of it now that they're aware of the problem as well. Well, it'll be a less responsibility for you. I mean, obviously, in our lives, if we ever see a friend slipping or making a wrong decision, we always want to speak up because we love them. But at the same time, if if you were my friend and you came to visit me, I would just want you to say emotionally, mentally, to somewhere happy. Okay. Okay. But, you know, definitely... You know, keep us involved. We'd love to support you as much as we can, and I really appreciate you calling in. Well, thank you. All right. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's really tough. Um, You know, I remember, gosh, three, four years ago now, my dad was dealing with lung cancer, kidney cancer, and brain cancer, and it was really hard not to want to ask a lot of questions about his health care. Is he taking his pills? How does he feel? You know, really going into Nancy nurse mode. But I, what I realized is I best served to be his daughter, to allow him to be taken away from dealing with his cancer and just being a sense of a positive space for him, a safe place for him to go. Now, everybody's situation is going to be different. In in our last caller scenario, thankfully, there's family that's able to 
press a little bit and be that connection of the message to to help her um, medically. But I know our caller will go in to do great things and and really be that special friendship that her friend going through this time needs. Um, as we kind of wrap up today's show, I know we're talking about obstacles. We've covered a lot today and really heavy topics and then some that are lighter. But I want to bring this back to you. As you sit here today, what are you dealing with? What is your challenge, your obstacle, your fears? Because we can hear callers call in. We can hear the positive message and really the vulnerable story that Noah shared with us of his life. But when it comes down to it, the Living Full Out show is about motivating you. It's about you feeling safe, you feeling supported. So before we wrap up today's show, I just want you to tap into where you are in this moment. If you are feeling stressed or you're feeling mentally, emotionally not safe, I want you to reach out to somebody and get that support. Because really, when I think about the friends and family in my life, when I think about even my great production team here with me, we all want everybody to be happy. But beyond that, we want us to be safe. And so I don't want to talk about just obstacles today being a fleeting thought. These are real moments in our life. These are crossroads in our life that block our ability to move forward. So here going forward, think about what is that block? What is that obstacle? What can you do today to get support or to motivate yourself? You know, sometimes we just feel as though life is passing us by. We feel as though we're stuck in a rut. And that's a very real feeling as well. We may have lost a job. You may have financial stress and the money just isn't flowing in in a timely manner. Whatever it is that is making you feel heavy on your heart or keeping you up at night, there are ways to get around this time in our life. Um, And I want you to think about what resources can you utilize today? Who can you call? Go online, see if there's a low cost option, a free option, anything that can help to move you forward. If you need support, I want you to feel free to give us a call at Living Full Out. You can reach me directly at 310-909-7800, extension 101. You can also listen to our show each week um, by going to livingfullout.com. And again, the basically the the big thing here is I just want you to know that there are books out there, our show, the friends and family in your life, we're all in this together. And it's about pushing those obstacles aside so we can live our lives full out. I want to thank our production team, Diane, Mindy, Ashana, Rich over there in Maryland. Thank you so much for everybody who puts time and effort into the show. And again, thank you callers for calling in. Feel free to email us. Go to livingfullout.com. We'd love to hear about the challenges that you're facing so we can build shows to help motivate you. Feel free to follow us on Spreaker so that you can be posted on upcoming shows and, and what those topics are. Truly, I want to thank you for listening to the show today. I want all of you to go out there today. And even if you don't do something that's a big success or accomplishment, just smile and try to enjoy life because this gift of life that we have truly is a gift. When I think about Noah, when I think about our callers and everybody who courageously called in, they're treasuring that gift. They're wanting to get better each and every day. And I want that same thing for you. Thank you, and here's to you living your life full out.